Aloha, and welcome to Live from Noir Lab at Hawaii. My name is Jamika. I am an outreach assistant here at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's Noir Lab. Joining me today will be two amazing science guests, uh, Jesse Ball and Jose Cortez. I look forward to introducing you to them a bit later. Uh, to begin with though, uh, as your host, I am delighted to have as moderator, Alyssa Leilani Losi. She will be in the YouTube audience for your questions and comments. And I definitely would like to um, highlight that we are happy to receive your comments and questions in the chat at any time throughout today's presentation. Uh, Alyssa will interact with you, answer your questions as can, and also share your questions and comments with our science guests today, Jose Cortez and Jesse Ball. Before we get to our science guests, let's have a little bit of background about the International Gemini Observatory. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the International Gemini Observatory, it is one of five programs of NSF's NORLAB, which is the preeminent US National Center for ground-based nighttime optical and infrared astronomy. Gemini Observatory is composed of twin telescopes, Gemini North located on Mauna Kea and Gemini South, or North Central Chile's Cerro Pachon. Now, each telescope has a mirror diameter of about 8.1 meters or about 26.5 feet. And today's science guests, uh, Jesse Ball and Jose Cortez will be able to elaborate on that, uh, on those specs a little bit more. Uh, but the, one of the fabulous things about uh, Gemini's capabilities is that with a telescope in each hemisphere, the International Gemini Observatory can actually observe objects throughout the entire night sky. More about the International Gemini Observatory can be found in the video description below. Um, feel free to check those out when you have a chance. Okay, so um, some science news. What's going on at Gemini? And if you can uh, start that video for me, Jesse, thank you so much. So some exciting science here. Astronomers have used the International Gemini Observatory, again, a program of NSF's NOR Lab and other telescopes around the globe and in space to find and characterize a giant planet. Uh, and this planet is less than 13.8 times as massive as Jupiter. And the surprising thing is that this planet was found orbiting a white dwarf star. Now, the exciting thing about this finding is that this can shed some light on the possible outcome of not only our sun, but our solar system at the end of our sun's life. To find out more information about this press release and to also get uh, download uh, the, this video, this is our CosmoView episode 10 in our CosmoView series, which is on the NORLAB Astro YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. You can find links to the video and to this press release in the video description. Okay, so now to our science guests. So we're going to highlight Jesse. Jesse, I am so excited to have you here with us today. So for all of you in our YouTube audience, a little bit about Jesse. So Jesse graduated from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota in 2001 with a BA in physics with an emphasis on astronomy. His interest in astronomy was piqued by his undergrad advisor, Dr. Kim Venn, when she introduced him to the school's telescope and handed him the keys. <laughs> he started his operating career at a good cell observatory in Northfield, Minnesota at an historic 16 inch refractor that was mainly used for public nights and teaching students. 
After that, he moved on to the Stay C project in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to operate at a high energy astrophysics experiment that looked at Sherenkov particle showers from high energy astronomical sources, such as pulsars, gamma ray bursts, and active galactic nuclei. He came to Gemini in 2007 as a systems support associate. Since then, the position has grown to encompass much more than just operations, and Jesse has obtained a Master's of Optical Sciences from the University of Arizona while at Gemini. And here's a quote from Jesse. My career path is not typical of an astronomy student who often goes on to do research. I wasn't interested in doing the research, but being at the telescope and taking the data that goes into the research, um, that's really been a great fit for me. I like to be behind the wheel, as Jesse says. Now, Jesse now leads the group of operators and observers. This is the science operations specialist at Gemini North in Hilo. While not at the telescope, you would not be surprised to find Jesse relaxing on the beautiful Hawaiian beaches or brewing some delicious beers in his garage. Thank you so much, Jesse, for being here. Thanks, Janika. Good to be here. Our second science guest today is Jose Cortez. So, Jose graduated as a mechanical engineer in 1999 in Chile. Initially, he was thinking of working at, uh, at mining companies. This is what his prospects looked like. But he saw an ad and answered an ad about a telescope operator needed in, Las, in the La Silla uh, Las, Observatory. So he worked there with a medium-sized telescope. These are about 2.2 and 3.6 meter telescopes. And he worked with uh, CCDs, cryogenics, and also dealt with the optical components. Now, in 2005, Jose moved to Paranal Observatory with his eight meter UT telescopes. Um, and this was an amazing experience for him. He's worked with laser guided telescopes, the multi fiber spectrographs, uh, imaging, interferometry, and, and also working in the service mode operations. But in 2009, he moved to the then in construction Alma Observatory, where he worked for the next nine years, commissioning the 66 radio astronomy antennas of its array. Now, uh, in 2018, he moved to Gemini, where he is currently, and he's working with uh, our amazing eight meter infrared oriented telescope, where he has observer's responsibility, and he also does data analysis. For Jose, it's been a 20 years, 20 years of an amazingly incredible and unexpected journey. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jose. Well, thanks to you, Jamika. All right, so I will kick it over to you, Jesse and Jose. And again, for those of you in our YouTube audience, um, Alyssa will be sharing your questions and comments with us throughout the show. Take it away, Jesse and Jose. Thank you, Jamika. Well, I'd like to start talking about a little of telescopes and uh, people have to understand that the telescopes has evolved a lot since um, many centuries ago, uh, but the basic idea is the same. We try to collect energy from a, so a very distant source. So there are many different types of reflectors of telescopes that have been developed. And uh, one is a direct approach. You, you have a, a lens that in the aperture that uh, concentrate the energy in a focal, in a focal plane position. And then you collect it with the eye or you collect it with an instrument. Then we move to uh, uh, objective prime focus structure, and you can see in, in the left, the second left. And then you collect the energy through a mirror and concentrate a, a curved mirror, and you concentrate in a focus position. Then Newton improved that. There is the Newtonian uh, structure of the telescope, so you have a, a third telescope, a second telescope, sorry, a second mirror that deviate the light 
to a, a focus position outside of the tube of the telescope. And in order to get bigger and bigger and try to collect more and more energy, we, at some point, it, it was uh, designed um, a two mirror structure with, a, with the primary mirror with a hole in the middle and try to collect the energy in the bottom of the telescope. And it was called the Cassegrain structure. This is actually what Gemini telescope is, is uh, defined. And you can see the picture there. You can see the little hole. It's not little, but you can see the hole in the middle of the primary mirror. So the idea is, uh, as I said, try to collect energy. Uh, you have to, you can make uh, mirrors as big as eight meters as a solid thing. This uh, uh, Gemini mirror is an eight meter telescope, an eight meter mirror, uh, it's the same as the DLT uh, UT telescopes in Paranal. And it's, it's done uh, by a, an alloy of um, low expansion, 55 blocks of low expansion glasses, fused together at 1700, uh, 17 Celsius uh, degrees. And, and then they have to be polished and prepared in optic facilities and eventually installed on the telescope. So the idea of these uh, mirrors is to be deformable and, and to be manipulable. So you can, you can handle it and, uh, and you can deform it in order to compensate uh, the formations produced by the inclination of the telescope or the tilt uh, when, when you point to different areas of the temperature. And then the idea is to, uh, if you wanted to collect more energy, you would have problems building a bigger telescope. So new generation telescopes are, are um, structured in, a, in, in, in beehive uh, uh, panels. So you have pentagrams and, and you can put them together and then you will have a, a mirrors of 20 meters diameter or maybe more which is a CMC telescope, it's a 30 meter telescope, and uh, also in Chile there are all, also another giant telescope, telescope being built. So Jesse, if you can move uh, next to the next slide. So before we move on, there is a, we have our first question in the chat already. Yeah. So this question is, where can we access your data on unidentified moving objects in our solar system? Well, every data we take, uh, it's passed to a database and it has to, it has to be processed and analyzed. It, it, it belongs to the astronomers that created the programs and also for Gemini. Some of them are being made public, but uh, I had to say that, um, uh, I'm not familiar with the, the process of uh, when they got public, actually. And, um, so I believe, I, I can help out with that. I believe um, our data um, is, is no longer proprietary after six months, if that's correct. And the Gemini archive should be public, and, and you can probably find more information about that on gemini.edu on our website. Thank yeah, you, Jose. Right. Um, I will make sure to um, add a link to uh, a specific link to the cloud cams and to some of our uh, to the image gallery in the video description so that uh, if anyone is wanting to uh, uh, look at that data, it will be available. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Great. you, Alyssa, for our questions, our comments from the YouTube audience and uh, audience members. Keep those coming. Okay. Back to you, Jesse and Jose. Great. So uh, the, the next thing I, I, I wanted to say about, I'll talk a little about is about the mirror itself. The, the mirror in Gemini, you can see a person inside it, uh, inside the hole where the cassette grain instrument receives the light. And the mirror itself is coded to, to, for, to reflectness. And um, it was uh, discovered that silver gave us a better reflectance uh, in the wavelengths that we observe in infrared. So this telescope is oriented to observing the infrared wavelengths of the, of the spectrum of the light. And um, 
it's coated with silver. And you can see the graph there, over 450 nanometer wavelength. The reflectance uh, of silver, a bare, a bare silver is, um, or four layer in this case of the Gemini telescope is greater than the aluminum normal uh, coating that the uh, astronomy telescope has. Uh, in the bottom, you can see uh, the the observance uh, windows that we have in different wavelengths and what molecules correspond to that wavelength. So you can see that, that there is a huge, um, there is this observance between four and five, and then you have a jump until to eight microns, which is uh, 8,000 uh, micrometers uh, nanometers. So, so the idea is to observe in the infrared and Gemini is oriented to that. Even the structure of the telescope is a little deformed and uh, the, the distance between the focus, the, between the two mirrors, the primary mirror and the secondary mirror are a little shorter than normal telescope in order to improve the uh, collection of infrared information. May I ask a question here, Jose? Sure. Okay. so. You were saying that the, the Gemini's mirror is coated with silver as opposed to um, as, as opposed to aluminum. As opposed to aluminum, yes. So what is the what's the advantage of having silver as the coating um, instead of aluminum? Yeah, it, it, uh, as I said, it has better reflectance in the in the wavelengths that uh, for the infrared. So they can the amount of uh, energy you collect is greater because uh, it, 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 the, the amount you lost uh, in, the, in, the, in the reflection of the mirror is, is shorter, it's less. Uh, Thank you. But the, Thank you. in the other hand, the, the, to, to coat the mirror with silver is a very complicated process, much more than aluminum. But here we have an, an, a, a huge and amazing plan to do that. Okay, and uh, I, I would love to hear about uh, this coding process, but maybe Jesse's already going to talk about that, so I won't. Yeah. I won't skip ahead. But uh, definitely fascinating to to see that um, this this mirror is huge. Of course, just to to see one person there um, down uh, in the in the in the circle there in the hole and to to realize that the mirror is that huge and that this this coating process is something that has to be done um how many times twice a year no no not at all uh, we actually go at, we coat the mirror uh, we try to coat the mirror once every three years and, and i don't have a slide about the process but in real quick the basics of it is uh we we put this giant mirror downstairs in a big vacuum chamber that looks like a this flying saucer um, we strip it using um, an acidic solution, so there's so it's just down to the glass, and then they spatter on um, very very fine layers of silver um, with very accurate precision to the to the form of the mirror. Thank you for giving some clarity to that for us, Jose and Jesse. Okay, continue on. <laughs> Thank you. Can you move uh, forward, please? Yeah, you can see uh, Andromeda galaxy here, taken by a, a different telescope. And you can see the optical in the right upper, in the left upper corner. That's, that was taken with the optical instrument. And then you can see in the left, in the right corn, upper corner, you can see this orange uh, image is the infrared image taken of the same galaxy. Uh, in below it, it is the X-ray uh, emissions taken by different instruments, and then you can make a, a, a composition of the of the three of them in the bottom left corner. So, what are the colors? You, of course, the detectors are very sensitive, and and to be very sensitive, uh, they are black and white. They they are, you, you don't see colors. So astronomers colors the images in order to show where there are more concentration of different components. So they use blue for oxygen or use uh, red for hydrogen or helium. So in that way, we can create a map of the galaxy and we could see where our most abundant uh, 
concentration of different uh, components, chemical components, and then you, we could see how is uh, the process of growing of the stars or in the, what state, what stage of the star are in, that, uh, in, in this moment. And then we have these colorful, great, amazing images, but they basically are maps of energy. And, and then we can uh, have information about their chemical composition, their age, their distance, and uh, their speed, their movement. And so many people ask uh, if we could see in colors. I mean, detectors are very sensitive and there has to be work. They have to work in a very low temperatures, like four Kelvin, almost zero absolute. So they basically collect energy uh, in black and white. I mean, in, in, in very sensitive uh, CCDs. Jose, but, I have to say, um, excuse me for interrupting you there. I'm really, really glad that you uh, talked about this point because yes, so many people are, are wondering and have asked me, and I've, I've looked myself before I really got into the astronomy field at these amazing images and wondered, do we see those colors? Is it, do they actually look like that? And, and if not, what do those colors represent? So here you're saying these colors can represent um, the abundance of different chemical signatures um, where we're looking at. And then just in general, um, the composite is made uh, to give us uh, an overall gorgeous image that helps us to visualize what's actually going on. And I, I just wanna say, um, I imagine that some people in the audience had that same question, like, does it actually have that gorgeous blue color in the center? So thank you for uh, for addressing that, Jose. Yeah, so can we move forward, Jesse, please? Okay, and just one clarifying point. Um, the, the reason we can get those colors is because we look at these images through um, different filters and those filters let in one specific color at a time. And then when we add these colors on top of each other, we can put them on maps. I think Jose said that, but I just wanted to clarify. I'll move to the next. Sure, sure. Um, and then I'd like to last to talk a little about the mirror itself. You can see the mirror is a deformable mirror. The, the eight meter cell mirror is a deformable mirror. So. Whenever you move this huge giant telescope, you have uh, physical bending. You have um, the, the mirror itself will deform because of its weight. And you start to lose the curvature that gives you the best focus concentration of the light of the, or the energy. So these telescopes have uh, actuators below it. So these actuators can actually push uh, the mirror and deform it in order to correct the shape of the of the curvature and re regain again the best focus uh, possible and the best concentration of light. This uh, Gemini telescope has 120 actuators below it, and also the adaptive optic system is installed in the secondary mirror. It has also another 150 actuators in order to give a second compensation fast compensation in order to be uh, doing on real time corrections to the curvature and, and concentration of the light. In the right, you can see uh, uh, the same uh, galaxy or, or, or um, cumulus of, of the stars. And you can see in the, in the right bottom corner, an image taken with an amazing scene of 0.3 that night. And you can see in the upper part, the same, the same stars taken with an adaptive optic system, which corrects the form and the curvature of the, of the mirror on real time. And then you can see the difference on, on definition and uh, the amount of information we can get uh, if we correct this uh, deformation of the telescope. So, it's an amazing thing. It's, a, it's an amazing and very complicated uh, system that allows us to use these giant telescopes in order to collect the, the much, uh, as much and as best defined uh, kind of energy. Jose, this is fascinating. Active and adaptive optics. So without these uh, active and adaptive optics, what what would observing at Gemini be like? 
Uh, I'm sorry. If we didn't have adaptive optics and, and the active optics to help compensate to deform the mirror so we can get those best images, what was done before the advent of adaptive optics? Was it? Uh... Well, be before these systems were invented or created, we had blurry images and uh, also uh, amazing images, but we, we want to move, to, to move forward. We want to get better and better. So. Before that, we had uh, blurry images or before uh, aberrated images like uh, with coma shape or with uh, out of focus sometimes. And it, it was it, it was a hard, uh, but it, it, it was a huge improvement for the time also. So we, we are moving forward in, in science. We are moving forward in the knowledge of humanity and uh, we are keep inventing and creating new technologies in order to get better and better. And we are almost uh, observing as we, we were in the space, as we were without the atmosphere over us, as uh, the forms, it, it works like a lens over us and it, it deforms and aggravates our images. But with all the technology we are using and we have created, uh, we are getting amazing images, like, like in space almost. And, uh, we're looking forward, we, we, we need to implement our laser guided system in order to observe in fields uh, uh, where we don't have guide stars. And, uh, but that's, uh, actually we have a, a one beam laser installed in Gemini, but Gemini South has a four beam laser, so you can do multiple guided and multiple corrections. And that's our future also for the next few years. And uh, it's a, Astronomy is an, it's an amazing uh, journey uh, through this century since the first telescope was invented or since the first person actually observed the sky for the first time and, start, and, and started to make maps of the stars and, 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 and study the movement of the, of, the, of the objects in the sky. Yeah, it, it tells us a, a, a lot about the, the universe, but also it pushes technology to move forward and forward. And the, 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 this creation, this invention that done for astronomy are, are later applied for for day-to-day -day, uh, life. So if you think, for example, the GPS, GPS in the cell phones was a, 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 an experiment to de demonstrate uh, Einstein theory. And they used three satellites to calculate the curvature of the light while passing close to the Earth. Uh, and the experiment failed, and uh, experiment failed, but they discovered that they could map with a precision of meters any position in the surface of air. So as a side effect of this uh, astronomy or physics experiment, we created an amazing tool for mapping and for location. It's the same with, with uh, many other things, that the work they've done in cryogenic, trying to use uh, very sensitive detectors, it's, it's then passes to normal cameras and then all digital cameras have PCDs where, where they were invented for astronomy actually. And some people doesn't realize um, how astronomy is affecting their lives in, in the day to day. That is an absolutely brilliant point to make, Jose. I'm really glad that you that you brought this up and made that connection between um, astronomy and those um, advances in science uh, and, and how the technology that we, we are accustomed to using every day has changed and that a lot of that change has been prompted by advances in, in the sciences, specifically in astronomy. Uh, and I love that example that you used uh, with the, the GPS, that, that, that is great. And it is important for us uh, to get that out there uh, to, to everyone to understand that um, Science, astronomy in general, uh, specifically, is it's it's not just done on its own for its own means, but we can all benefit in various ways from investing in that science uh, and technology. So thank you for for pointing that out, Jose. Um, and now I have a question I'd like to throw to you and and Jesse. Um, Jose, you mentioned um, in this amazing image that you're showing us 
and the top um, is, is very clear and the bottom um, is not so much. You mentioned the phrase or the term seeing and said that this the seeing here was at about uh, 0.3. Uh, could either of you uh, quickly tell us what seeing is? Well, uh, seeing is, um, how can I say, it's the it's amount of, uh, you, you see, you have the atmosphere over us. The atmosphere, is, atmosphere works as a lens and um, it, deforms, it, it deforms the images that we observe. And atmosphere is made of, out of layers. We, we try to think about it as layers. And there are some models created to, to simulate or to modulate the atmosphere as layers. And each layer is a different lens that deforms your light and, and bends your light and, and moves your light in angles. So the result that we observe is a blurry image that's a jumping star that is jumping all over the place in, in a few, in many times in a few in, in seconds. So we try to compensate that and we try to 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 correct the shape of the mirror or the shape of the secondary mirror in order to get rid of this uh, jumping and, and mm -hmm. little real time deformation. So a good thing uh, the, uh, it's 1.0 that 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 is a, a parameter created for evaluated seeing. And right now, in the best places for observation, the best places for astronomy, you, you could have as as good as 0 0.3, even 0 0.2, 0 0.25, uh, uh, which I, I have seen I have seen in Gemini also and in Paranal Observatory. And I don't know if you want to add something, Jesse, about that. Yeah, sure. Just just to break it down to something a little bit more tangible, um, um, I don't know if, if if all of our audience is gonna is gonna understand atmospheric layers, but I think um, back in the days when we could travel on airplanes, if everybody remembers, there are bumps and turbulences in the atmosphere. That's exactly what's causing these blurs and shaking in the image. It's like if you're in a hot summer day looking over a barbecue and you look through and you see that blur or over the top of a car's engine, or if you're a diver going through these thermal clines and seeing the blurs in front of you, that's exactly what astronomers refer to as, as seeing. That's, that's just the blur of the atmosphere, basically. Okay, the blur of the atmosphere is what seeing is. Okay, now that, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I know, I think you're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, on some of your slides later. So uh, I just wanted to put that, make sure we define that term ahead of time before we, uh, before we continue. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Jose, did you have anything more on? on, on no, no, please go ahead. We are, it took okay. too long. All right, to, to, in the interest of, of continuing on here. So Jose touched on this a little bit. Why, why are we even using the telescopes in the first place? And, and in the next slides or so, I'll get into how we use them, um, at least the large telescopes these days. But really the point is just to, to learn about what the universe is and, and how it works, what's, what's around us. And, and other than just these spectacular images that Jose was showing us, a really important tool for astronomers is the spectrograph. And I, I would say most, um, it, we gather most of our data through spectrographs, which is basically just a prism. So we send the light through a prism we break it down into all its constituent colors. And from each one of those individual colors, we can see how bright or how dim it is. We can tell what the, the source we're looking at is made up of or what's in between the source and our planet. So that's just kind of um, you know, a segue into, um, this is why we're getting the data and, and now um, you know, how do we get it? So a lot of people might have this romantic idea of an astronomer as somebody sitting under the night sky and looking through a telescope and that's certainly how it was way back when. Um, and but even nowadays astronomers aren't always at the telescopes themselves so. Um, a few years back tens of years back um, astronomers did visit the telescopes in what's called classical observing mode. And they would get assigned, they would propose, hey, I want to take this data. And they'll get us, the, the telescope will say, okay, you can have these nights, or you can have this night, or this week. And uh, the astronomer would have to come to the telescope during that week and get their data no matter what um, the conditions were. You can imagine sometimes astronomers would get them in the middle of winter and it, they would get snowed out and they would get no data and they would have to reapply the next year for their, um, for their time. 
and it could be very frustrating. And it's also very inefficient use of the telescope. You, got, you could have some astronomers that didn't need good conditions, but they got perfectly good conditions. And then the astronomers that needed really good conditions, like no clouds, would come and it would be cloudy the whole night or something. So the way that large telescopes um, maximize the efficiency of gathering data is something called cue observing. And that's, that's what we do at Gemini. Um, so the way the cue works is that um, astronomers from, from all of the different um, areas that, that have access to the telescope, at Gemini, we, we are an international telescope. So there are these six or seven countries that can all apply for time and they, they get time based on the shares that, that they buy in. Um, but these, these researchers from these different countries, they'll apply for time, they'll, they'll tell this, they'll apply to this time allocation committee. That's what this TAC is called. Um, they'll say, I want to get this data and I want it because this science is important and this is why I need these specific conditions. So they'll, they'll give us, um, they'll, they'll, they'll submit their proposal. And then once a semester at Gemini, uh, most, I think most of, uh, observatories work on a semesterly basis, the time allocation comes together, reviews all these proposals and ranks them. So they'll say, well, this science seems really exciting and important, so we'll give them top priority. And this could be really useful, but it's not as important as that, so we'll give them second priority and, and, and so on. Um, and at Gemini, we, we have the individual partner countries will have their own national time allocation committees. And then the selected science that's awarded time from those comes into a bigger committee called the International Time Allocation Committee, the, the, the ITAC. And the ITAC meets for about two weeks, once a semester, and goes through all of these different scientific proposals and decides how to rank them, who gets what time on the telescope. And the advantage of working in Q mode is that they put all of this, all of these proposals, all of this science into this, this big Q. Now some, like I said earlier, some of the, some of the observations can take clouds and, and it's fine because they're looking at bright stars or something. Some of them need to get photometrically accurate data so they can have no clouds whatsoever. Some of them are looking for good image quality. So the seeing has to be good. Um, some of them, the photometry, for example, they might not, they might not be able to take clouds, but they can't take, uh, but they can take horrible scene because they're just looking for the energy in, inside of a cer certain aperture. So all these different constraints that different programs have, different proposals have, can be sorted out and put into this, this queue where they organize um, the ranking of the program, the conditions, constraints, and, um, and what happens is that at observatories that run a queue, you have staff observers and staff astronomers working to take that data for you. So the, the, the actual scientists doing the research on this data doesn't always come here to our telescope. In fact, they hardly ever do. Um, sometimes they'll chime in on Zoom or, or whatever, but, um, but usually they're at home sleeping and we're taking their data for them. And, and the rest of this, this uh, presentation is kind of how, how we get that data. Um, so the first thing is in the daytime, at least at Gemini here and, and at most Q observ uh, um, observatories, uh, do, do we have a question, Jamika? Sorry, I see. Oh, no, uh, no question. I'm just oh, okay. uh, engaged in what you were saying ah, okay, and uh, okay. just following you. I apologize. Okay, okay, no worries. No, all good. Um, okay, so um, during the daytime, um, uh, Gemini has has a, a, a bunch of Q coordinators. One, one will be working at a time. And what the Q coordinator's job is, is to, to look at what the sky is going to look like tonight, check out the weather predictions, um, check out what is in our queue, what are the different rankings of different programs, and what, what do we want to have, what's their top priority. They, be, they basically prioritize all of these um, potential observations for the night, and they put a plan together for, for the observer. Um, there's, a little, there's a little graphic under here of what one of these plans looks like, but, but basically what you'll see is all these different targets lined up throughout the night at different times and, and notes about how do we take these programs and, and whatnot. Um, so, um, what was I gonna say? I yeah, actually so do you have yeah, a question ahead. right go now, ahead. if this is a good time. Sure. Um, so, uh, as you begin your 
the process of, of getting ready to, to observe for the evening, what time are the your SOS group, what, what time does your position <laughs> begin? Are you starting at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, 5 p.m.? How does that, how does that go? Okay, great question. And I will definitely dig more into the, uh, the role of the operations specialist in a few slides here. So let me hold off on answering that. And, and if you still have questions about that after the next few slides, if it's not clear, come back. Okay. Um, okay, so, so the Q coordinator puts together these plans and, and they put together a plan um, for all the different variants. So they'll have one plan if the sky is full of clouds and if the seeing is good, take this data in this order. And if the sky has no clouds and the seeing is poor, take this data. And, and basically uh, we have plan variants for all the different possible conditions. Um, so that's, that's, what's done, that's, that's what's done by the Q coordinator during the day. And what the Q coordinator does at that point is hands over to the night observer um, who has to go through it and execute these, these various um, plans based on the weather. Um, so th this kind of segues into what the role of the science operations specialist is um, at Gemini. There are, there are names for, for us at other observatories. Some call them telescope operators. Some call them service observers. Uh, what we will call is science operations specialist. And you'll see in a minute, it's because we do a lot more than just sit and operate the telescope. Um, but the, the, one, the first role I'll get into because it segues from, from putting the queue together is the night observer. Um, what the, the nighttime observer does is go through the Q coordinator's plan and check what the weather actually is, and then decide based on all these different variants, what is the most effective way to use our telescope um, according to what the Q coordinator told us. So we'll look through all these plans, we'll look at the weather conditions, and then we will decide what to observe uh, based, on, based on that um, priority. Um, Another thing that the nighttime observer is doing, um, you know, not only are they observing this queue, um, they're, they're also, as the data comes in, we have to check to make sure it looks right. So we have a quick quality assurance tests. Uh, we look at the data as it comes in. We don't analyze it. We don't put together, you know, research outcomes, but we look at the data and say, is this the kind of data that the researcher wants, and we make sure it is, and then we pass it along to the archive so the researcher can have access to it after that. Um, and at the same time we're doing that, we're also keeping careful log of what's happening throughout the night. So if anything is going wrong the next day, they can see exactly what happened and when during the nighttime. So Jesse, yeah. um, um, usually in the in the evenings. Um, those of us who are, are Gemini staff here, uh, in our emails, we'll get something that says, you know, Gemini North, um, you know, nighttime log, or we'll get Gemini South nighttime log, and we'll also get uh, uh, project insights. Uh, do either of those, um, is either of those giving us information about what's happening, either what's coming up for that evening, or for example, that when we get the night log, say in the morning around uh, 6 a.m., is that telling us the outcome of that previous evening's observing? That's exactly right. And that was one of the, the roles of the observer that I was just mentioning. That's exactly right. So they'll write this log of what's happening in the night. We flew to this program. We moved to this program. The sky changed. We had to switch to another plan. Um, it'll tell you the, the sequence of events. And usually it'll be sent out with a nice um, concise summary at the beginning. So people who don't want to dig through every single log can just look and say, oh, this is kind of how the night went. Um, and yeah, and, and the Gemini staff all, all get that email in the morning just to, to be able to keep up with, with what's been going on with, with observing. So to get back into your earlier question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over the, the, the different responsibilities that my group has, that our group has, the, the science operations specialist. Um, and we just kind of already went over the, the observer role on that second bullet point on this, on this slide. Um, but, but to answer your question, um, Jamika, we usually come in, the night staff usually comes in um, about half an hour before sunset, and we usually leave between sunrise and, and a little bit after, depending on what kind of follow-up they have to do after the night's data is done. So it's in the winter, especially in Chile, it can be super, super long nights, up to 14 hours. In the summer, it can be nice and short. We can have, you know, in, in Chile, again, like a seven, six hour, seven hour night. So um, in Hawaii here, it's a little bit more even. It's usually around 12 hours um, per night. Um, that's 
uh, I'm really glad you you brought up that point that uh, of course as, as as our seasons change then the length of, of nighttime changes and of course um, as we we just know we just recognize the the fall equinox the autumnal equinox here in, in the northern hemisphere and so now we're seeing these um, our nighttime is it's approaching earlier it used to be dark at 7 30 and now 6 20 it seems like here in Hawaii um, it's dark and so yeah I, I hadn't thought about how how that um, how that influences and, and, and actually impacts your your work schedule. So as your um, as your as your SOS team is is getting ready uh, to start operations, are they actually coming into the Hilo base facility uh, or at the Gemini South? Are they going down to the uh, Gemini South base facility and? And can you tell us a little bit about what's behind you? Is that an actual <laughs> virtual background or are you someplace and um, actually that it looks like that? Is that a physical place? That's a, that's a great point. And thanks for bringing that up, Jamika. Uh, um, yeah, so um, that, that's a really good point because um, it, it depends on the observatory. At, in some observatories, we do operations right on top of the mountain at the, at the uh, telescope itself. Um, what Gemini has done in the last five or six years is move to remote operations. So right now, I mean, if, if you can all see behind me, I'm actually sitting in our operations control room right now um, at Gemini in Hilo at sea level, right across the road from um, the Imiloa Astronomy Center and, and on the college campus here. Um, so yeah, we do, we do our operations completely remotely. We still have a day crew that goes up to this telescope during the day to do maintenance and, um, and other type of, of technical work on the telescope itself. But the night crew actually now operates all fully remotely. We have cameras all over the observatory to show us what's going on with the different systems. We have, um, you know, we have all sorts of feedback on, on, on everything that we need to know to operate safely from down at sea levels. So we're probably about 35, 40 miles away from the actual telescope itself. So great question. Thanks, Jamika. Um, OK, so aside from just nighttime observing, um, the science operations specialists have three other roles, um, which, which kind of encompass all different facets of the observatory, all different departments, engineering, software, all, all sorts of stuff. And I'll get into it. But the other nighttime role um, of, of the, the science operations specialist at Gemini is, is the operator. And that's the, the, the one that actually drives the telescope. And what their job is, um, at night is to is to listen to the observer's requests and the observer will say, hey, we want to go to this target and the operator will set up the telescope on that target and they will close guide loops, Jose alluded earlier to guide stars and guide loops, but basically the guide stars are what can keep our, our optics in, in the right shape. So we always have to set up um, guiding in order to tell our mirrors how to move to keep the um, to keep the images with the least amount of blur possible, so the operator will set up those that guiding, um, and then once the guiding is set up and 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 the operator hands back to the observer and says, "Okay, go ahead and take the data." Um, during that time that the data is taken, the operator is monitoring the weather conditions to make sure the telescope and all of its systems are safe. Um, and, and we're monitoring um, not only the weather, but the, the systems themselves, because sometimes the systems can go into a fault and they have to troubleshoot. Um, a lot of times we'll know what to do um, when a certain problem comes up because it's, it's happened before, but sometimes we don't know what to do and we have to, to first order, try to investigate what's happening. And, and if we don't figure that out, we can, we can call some engineers to, to get some help on the way. Um, so yeah, so basically the night operator and the night observer act as a team throughout the night from sunset to sunup um, to try to get all this data for the researchers and, and make sure the data is what, what they want and make sure we're getting the highest priority data out of the queue that we can. Hey Jesse, we have two questions in our YouTube chat. Our first question is, Earth telescopes, which wavelengths provide the most information and its relationship to the operating time? In its relationship to the operating time. I think um, they meant, and what is its relationship to the operating time? Okay. It's, um, the, the, there's no short answer because it really all depends on what kind of science you're doing and what kind of instrument you're using. 
So as Jose said, the Gemini telescope is really sensitive to near infrared light. Um, and, and, and we take a lot of data in the near infrared, but we also take optical data as well. And, and the time that it takes to get that data really depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at a faint source, it takes a long time to get it. If you're looking at a bright source, it's pretty quick. Um, so do you had you had one more you said, Alyssa? Yes, our second question is, what kind of observations can you make while having poor seeing conditions? Okay, um, real quick to answer that question. A lot of times when people are looking at photometry, um, basically what they wanna know is just how bright is this star? How, what is the magnitude of this star? And you can really tell how bright it is no matter how blurry it is. And if it's blurry, that's fine. So a lot of times if you have poor seeing, you can, you can do photometry still. Um, you can also gain information from the spectra with poor seeing if you don't need high spatial resolution. So spatial resolution is how sharp the image is. So anytime you want data that doesn't depend on the sharpness, you can deal with poor seeing and it's just fine. So um, it looks like we only have uh, 10 minutes left here. So I'm gonna try to cruise through the next two parts and, and hand it back to Jose real quick. Um, th there's two other roles that the, uh, the science operations specialists have. Um, the daytime operations is a, is a critical, critical role. What the daytime SOS does is basically comes in in the morning. In fact, it's what I'm doing today at the observatory. We come in in the morning, we, we check on the night log, see what happened. Um, we look at the, any data that the observer could, didn't have a chance to look at and make sure it passes the, the quality assessment test. Um, and, and, and then we also, we, coordinate for the day with what's going to happen with the telescope during the day. Sometimes the engineers need to test. Sometimes instrument scientists need to, to look at their instruments. So um, basically the, the daytime operator is checking on the night's data, coordinating the day throughout the day with, with different people that need access to the telescope throughout all the different facets of the observatory, all the different departments. And sometimes we help on troubleshooting issues when they come up. And then in the afternoon, what we do is we, we take uh, instrument checks and calibrations and make sure the instruments that we're going to use that night are ready for, for use. And at Gemini, we use three to four instruments per night on the telescope. So it's, it's, not a, it's, it's, not a, it's a time consuming job during the day. Um, and the last thing the daytime operations specialist does is they will send out notes to the night staff and, and, and communicate basically what what has happened during the day and, and everything is ready for the night and, and any kind of information that needs to get to the night staff because they've been sleeping all day, of course. Um, that, that's what the daytime SOS does. And finally, um, at Gemini specifically and, and maybe at some other telescopes as well, um, our, our science operations specialists um, are able to get involved with any other projects in the observatory that they have an interest to do. And I mean, we have our staff, we have people for all over the spectrum. We have some people with engineering backgrounds, some people with software backgrounds, some people that are just plain operators. Um, and, and all of these people, you know, have different skill sets and, and different things that interest them. So what we try to do is get these different SOSs involved in different projects throughout the observatory that will challenge them and, and pique their interest. And it really it means that the science operations specialist is kind of a glue that holds together all the different departments in the observatory. So that's kind of a segue to um, Jose's uh, next slide, which is the, the last of it, which is just a brief um, uh, talk about uh, the career path, because the career path of a science operations specialist is not a usual um, astronomer's career path. It can be from many different um, backgrounds. So I'll hand it over to Jose to talk about a little bit about his um, career path. Hi. Uh, well, just a, a little talk about that. Uh, I, I'm a mechanical engineer. I didn't have too much experience in astronomy when I was at the university. Um, but I saw this uh, ad uh, about a telescope operator and I took it and it was an amazing surprise. And I found that the telescopes are pretty much uh, prototypes of itself. They are built for specific purposes uh, with the specific goals they had their own mechanics, they had their own uh, hydraulic system, they had their own software, they had their own dedicated instruments. So each one of them has uh, uh, specifications and troubleshooting. And I found that you can learn that and you can, it's kind of a job you learn by doing it. And uh, if the background you have is important. I had a bi mechanical engineer background. For me, the telescopes are amazing machines. 
amazingly precise machines and uh, like jewels and uh, hydraulic jewels. But in, other people come from the software side and they can find that the programming of the telescope is amazing also and difficult because you have to process a lot of huge and big data in a very short time. And also you have to be uh, efficient and, uh, and, and precise. And I found colleagues that they came from different backgrounds. I had even a colleague that was an English teacher in Chile. And the, the goal here and the, and the thing here is that you, you could adapt and you could learn. And if you like technology, if you like uh, science and, uh, and, and, and you think you can adapt it quickly to different softwares or platforms, you could do it. And uh, it's, 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 it's possible. And you will find an amazing career. And you will be learning all the time. I'm learning about astronomy every, every time and yeah, making my path uh, uh, through that. And you can see, uh, I have pictures uh, over there. I, I was standing over the dome in the 3.6 meter in the sea observatory where I started uh, this, uh, this career. I also was uh, taking out the, the cover of, of the secondary mirror in one of the alma antennas. In the upper left, in the upper right. I'm seated in the control room of the 3.6 meter telescope in the Sea Observatory. And the last one is an, uh, a gorgeous image of Jupiter that show up in my screen while I was observing in Gemini. I mean, that's Jupiter. That's a real Jupiter observed by an 8 meter telescope with uh, a Europa moon over it. And um, and I, I, I wanted to transmit to the people and to the audience that, uh, especially for the young people, that uh, it's a career you can achieve. It's a career you can do. You do not have to be Einstein. You don't have to be a genius to work in astronomy. Uh, you, you just have to be a, a, a curious person. And, 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 uh, and I don't know, it's just... Uh, what I wanted to say about that. And you have to think of telescope as a special prototype with, uh, and whenever you start to do this job, you will start to learn about many things, about software, about uh, hydraulics, about cryogenics, and, uh, and uh, it's an amazing uh, journey. Yeah. Well Anything you wanna add there, Jesse? Oh yes, go ahead, please. No, I just said, well said, Jose. I, I don't have anything to add, and I know we're at the we're closing in on the top of the hour. So if there are any more questions, let's field those. Alyssa, anything for us? Uh, any last minute questions or comments from the YouTube audience? There are no more questions here, but thank you to everyone who tuned in. And I would like to add, uh, talking about observatory careers, there's a lot of different careers at an observatory. Only about twenty percent actually have PhDs in astronomy. Uh, in addition to the operating and observing jobs, there's a lot of engineering involved in software, mechanical. And then there's jobs like mine and Janika, who maybe you've tuned into a lot of these live from NORLAB programs, and we are always your hosts and moderators, in addition to our other NORLAB colleagues like Robert Sparks and Manuel. Um, so there's a lot of different jobs in science. If you like science, uh, but you're not particularly science-minded, there's a lot of different things that you can do to get involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I'm i going to add my two cents to that, too, just by saying yes, yes, yes. That is so true. Um, and certainly, uh, as everyone has, has said here, um, I, it's, it's amazing, an amazing experience to work in an observatory where everyone's skill set is put to use and is appreciated and to also have the opportunity to expand that skill set uh, through the mentoring programs and through um, other uh, classes that you can take for certification to to advance uh, your knowledge so um, yes we definitely want to encourage all of you who are interested in science to uh, follow through with that and to that end um, in the video description, I will make sure to have um, not only a link to uh, the NORLAB website where you can find out 
all about the um, the, the other facilities that make up um, Noir Lab, but also to Gemini's, um, Gemini's website as well. And we also have a link that talks about uh, career paths because um, not all career paths go from A to B, exactly as everyone said. All right, so uh, in this last minute, uh, Alyssa already alluded to the fact that we have uh, multiple, of course, uh, live from Nora Lab editions uh, that come from our various facilities. And next week, our live from Nora Lab will be from Chile. So this is our Inbibel desde Nora Lab program. And this is going to be with your host, Manuel Paredes. So um, please feel free to join us. Of course, we hope you do. And that is, again, right here on the Noir Lab YouTube channel. All right. I will leave it with Jose and Jesse to sign off. Uh, and I would like to uh, reiterate Alyssa's thanks. Uh, big mahalos to everyone for joining us. Jose and Jesse. OK. Just Thank you. Just reiterate, thank you for having us, and it's been, it's been a pleasure to be on. And I hope uh, I hope you and the audience had, had was able to learn something. So, mahalo. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for inviting us. Yeah. Thanks. We're very happy to have you both. Thank you so much, mahalo, and see you next time.